Hello, welcome to Didactics Online. This is going to be our introductory video to cranial motion as proposed by uh, Dr. William Garner Sutherland. Um, today we're going to be going through this with a couple different models and diagrams. We've also provided you with some diagrams that will be available on the website as well. Um, so to start, I'm going to give a brief intro to um, the basic five principles as proposed by William Garner Sutherland. Um, so the first principle was that there is inherent motility of the brain and of the spinal cord. The second is that there's rhythmic fluctuation of the cerebrospinal fluid. The third is that there's motion within the dural membranes. The fourth is that there's articular mobility of the bones of the cranium. And the fifth is that there is articular mobility of the sacrum in correlation to the motion within the cranium because of the dural pole from the um, dural motor surrounding the spinal cord. Um, so now we're going to start going through a few different of the diagrams to explain the basics of cranial motion. Um, so whenever you're looking at a diagram that looks like this that I've provided you with, this is going to represent your sphenoid, while this represents your occiput. If we're going to a lateral view, this is going to be representative of your sphenoid, whereas this is representative of the occiput. But today, we're also going to be using models that we have from this disarticulated skull. This representing the sphenoid, this representing the occiput. So what do you do if you don't have those at home while you're going through these videos? It can become very frustrating as you're trying to cover all of these different strain patterns and motions, and you're trying to correlate them to the axes that they correspond to. So what I suggest, and what helped me whenever I was studying for my board exam, I took a paper plate, and I cut it up into a few pieces. This is my occiput. This is my sphenoid, and these are my temporal bones. The parietal bones, you just kind of have to imagine because they're going to be above the top of the plate or the bowl, but this is a nice foundation, and it should be enough to get you going on your way as you're trying to understand the different, um, the different angles. And I did actually have a question on my board that did cover motion of the temporal bone as well in relation to a strain pattern, so it might be something worth doing. So now as we're talking about motion of this mechanism, it's really important to keep in mind, especially for terminology's purposes, the motion between the sphenoid, the occiput, in relation to the sacrum. So whenever we have our sphenoid tip forward and our occiput tip backwards into SBS flexion, that's going to create a pull on the dura surrounding the spinal cord, and that's going to pull the sacrum into what is its positional um, its postural position of extension, but this is going to be termed cranial flexion because, again, this motion of the sphenoid forward and the occiput backwards are called flexion as well. So if the sacrum moves posterior, it's considered flexion within the cranial mechanism. Likewise, if, these, if the sphenoid tips backwards into extension and the occiput tips forward, that's going to create a little bit of drag on the dura that allows the sacrum to rest forward into its sacral flexion postural position or its cranial position of extension. So it's really important to understand that those are going to be uh, conflicting terms to what you're probably used to. Additionally, any midline bone such as the sphenoid, the occiput, the sternum, the sacrum, any bone in your body where you only have one of that bone these are going to move into motions of flexion and extension. Flexion of the sphenoid and the occiput are going to correlate with, let me reach for my temporal here. Flexion is going to correlate with external rotation of any paired bone. So I have my temporal bone here to represent a paired bone. It's going to go into external rotation whenever you have flexion. If you have extension, it's going to go into internal rotation. This carries out anywhere on your body as well. So these can be some really easy points if you're looking at an examination, but they're also very important principles to keep in mind whenever you're actually trying to practice any of this on your own. So here's a representative diagram showing the reciprocal membranes within the skull. We're going to be using these as they guide the skull through different motions um, and the different strain patterns and within the different um, relationships to the sacrum as well. So that is going to be available to you as well. We already talked about SBS flexion. We're going to talk about it again in a little bit more depth. So keep in mind that there are two transverse, um, two transverse axes that are going to be guiding the motion of the sphenoid and the occiput 
and their basic postural motions. So you're going to have a pole here and another axis pole here. And as the sphenoid tips forward, the occiput will tip backwards. And that's going to provide SBS flexion. Also depicted in this diagram, you can see they're both tipping in opposite directions around two parallel transverse axes. This carries true with SBS extension as well. There will still be two transverse axes, only this time your sphenoid will be tipping posterior and your occiput will be tipping anterior. That will represent SBS extension. And whenever I'm talking about the occiput, I'm talking about the most superior portions. That's what I mean when it tips anterior, or when it tips up anterior, because the base of the occiput is still actually moving posterior as well. So again, that's SBS extension. And you can see in this diagram as well, they're moving in opposite directions around those transverse axes. And again, keep in mind, there is a relationship as well with paired bones whenever we're talking about all of these motions. So if you have a temporal bone and you're talking about any strain pattern, a nice rule of thumb is that anytime you have the occiput low, if the occiput tips low on one side, that's going to carry the temporal bone into external rotation. So if you're talking about different torsional patterns, keep in mind the relationship of the low side of the occiput. Low side means external rotation. High side means internal rotation of the temporal. This is really important whenever you're approaching the different strain patterns, but also whenever you're talking about the basic motion of the cranial mechanism as well. So this concludes our first video. Our next video is going to be covering basic strain patterns, and um, I hope that you will find these videos helpful, as well as the diagrams. Try to keep them on hand whenever you're following through with the videos. Thank you for joining us.